full of myself. <laughs> anyway, well, uh, thank you very much. Thanks to the organizer, uh, organizers for inviting me. And um, uh, yeah, thanks to you for being here. Um, today I'm going to... Uh, can you hear me, by the way? Yeah? Okay. Um, uh, I'm going to be talking about the um, uh, analysis of some uh, data that we collected during uh, an experiment on involuntary attention. And we uh, used the RMS. So before starting, well, of course, yeah, there's, there's going to be a bit of background. So why we decided to uh, test um, involuntary attention and how we did it, what experimental paradigm we used, I'll show you the data and the results uh, using the RMS, and then some conclusions. So what have we learned after this? Uh, before starting, though, I would like to uh, acknowledge the contribution of uh, two master students, Sarina and Annelies. Uh, Sarina uh, collected the data for the pilot uh, experiment. And she also wrote uh, a very, like, really good uh, master thesis, uh, which is available on uh, uh, Thesis Commons on the Open Science Framework. So feel free to read it if you feel like it. Um, and then Annelise uh, uh, collected the data that I'm going to show you uh, today. And then Valentina and Gilles are uh, long-term collaborators, and they have with uh, many other things. Um, I could give you, uh, yeah, like a definition, a boring definition of involuntary attention, but let's watch a movie instead. Mm -hmm. well, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, what happened here? That guy was a bit angry. Uh, why? Because uh, he was attracted to the sounds that his phone was making, or at least he thought that. Um, and that was happening even though at some point he knew that his friend was making the notification sounds. Right? So what was happening there? So basically his attention was automatically attracted towards um, these sounds that were not really uninformative. They were, they were counterproductive because he was watching TV. He was engaging in a very important task, right? So he was, <laughs> so he was distracted from his task um, from the sounds, uh, by the sound. Um, of course, it's a silly example, but we can think of uh, slightly more uh, important uh, situations in which this is in, um, in, an interesting um, topic. For example, it can be dangerous in some real-life situations. Imagine that you are driving your car and then you are all of a sudden distracted by something flashy on your phone. Uh, you might cause an accident and hurt yourself or other people. Um, imagine uh, workers operating heavy machinery and then there are blinking lights here and there and they forget where their hands are, and then, you know, it can lead to serious accidents. Um, now, I think it's important then to study, um, you know, like this multifaceted um, uh, process that is in, uh, involved in attention, but uh, how can we do it in the lab? One way of doing it is to use uh, what is called the Temporal Order Judgment Task, or TOJ. Uh, in this task, uh, two stimuli are flashed on the screen, and people have to say uh, which of, this, of these two stimuli appeared first. And uh, we can manipulate difficulty by simply uh, changing the time uh, between the onset of the two stimuli. So uh, you would expect that the shorter the time between the two stimuli, the more uncertain people will be uh, uh, with respect to, the, uh, to which stimulus appeared first. So let me give you an example. The timing is not very great, but just to give you an idea, so you see that the uh, vertical lines appear before the horizontal lines, so participants in this case would have to say that the vertical lines appeared first. Uh, now, this is the basic uh, idea, but then uh, what we did was to also add an exogenous cue, so a, a little flash um, in one of the two placeholders, so one of the two um, boxes that you, that you saw uh, on the screen. Um, and what happens most, uh, most of the time is that people tend to say that the stimulus on the attended location, so where the cue was, when the cue appeared, uh, appeared, uh, was perceived as first, even if it's not true. Uh, I'm going to show you an example later on, but this is um, basically a sort of illusion. It's called a visual prior entry. It's a, a well-known phenomenon um, in, uh, uh, in Beijing. Um, now, the question is, what if the queue is always wrong? So what if the queue, every time, and people know that, so what if the queue is always appears on the uh, place where the second stimulus will appear? What will happen? Um, just let me, let me show you, for example, in this case, you see that there is a queue appearing here on, the, uh, on your left. Um, 
but the first target appears on the other side. So the correct answer is to say that the horizontal lines appeared first in this case. But will they say that the vertical lines appeared first just because their attention would automatically be oriented towards the queue? Even if they know that the queue is always wrong, it seems like it. Um, let me just uh, walk you through this um, uh, figure. So on the x-axis you have the SOA, the stimulus onset asynchrony. So this is when people are very, uh, so the, the, the onset between the two targets, is, uh, the two stimuli is very, very large and then progressively reaches zero. So this is a simultaneous presentation. Um, and just for, uh, as a convention, uh, you see a plus when the horizontal lines appear first and a minus when the vertical lines appear first. Um, on the y-axis, there is a proportion of horizontal first responses. Okay, so what you see, for example, on the uh, right part of the, of the graph is that when the horizontal lines actually appeared first, and you follow the black line, which is a situation in which there is no Q, so it's like our, you know, like our, our control condition, uh, you see that people will tend to respond to say that the horizontal lines appeared first very often, okay? Because it's very easy when the stimulus onset asynchrony is very large, to uh, detect the, the uh, onset of the first target. Um, and of course, uh, this is, uh, uncertainty uh, increases um, uh, uh, as a function of the, of the SOA. So when there is um, uh, yeah, a simultaneous presentation, people will just respond randomly. So 50% they will say that the horizontal lines appear first, and 50% that the vertical lines appear first. Now, what happens? Follow the yellow line. In this case, the vertical lines were queued, so this means that the horizontal lines always appeared first. In this uh, experiment, there is no situation in which the <coughs> vertical lines are queued and the vertical lines appeared first. Okay, just remember that because there is always the the, tar the, the queue is always counterproductive. Um, in this case, for example, let's look at this part. Um, people, in theory, should say should still say that the horizontal lines appear first quite confidently. Because it, there is, you know, the SOA is quite large, but because the Q was on the vertical lines, they respond less often that the horizontal lines appeared first. So there seems to be a sort of, you know, attentional orienting towards the opposite side. Um, to analyze this data, we used, as you may imagine, uh, Bayesian multi-level modeling. Uh, so it was a, a, a multi-level logistic regression with a varying intercepts and slopes on participants. And we used high, high informative priors uh, because we used the posterior distribution of the pilot data as a prior for, uh, uh, this, uh, for these models. So they were highly informative because we were expecting basically the same behavior and with, with high confidence. Uh, then we did some model comparison. So we specified models that were theoretically meaningful, uh, a priori already. You know, like we expect, for example, a, a, an effect of the Q or of the SOA. Uh, independent contribution of both, or uh, the full model with also the um, uh, interaction between uh, the SOA and the Q. So we wanted to check which of these ones uh, had the best predictive validity. And then on the winning model, uh, we did some diagnostics and posterior predictive checks and hypothesis testing. I will not go that much into detail on the uh, diagnostics, but I think that Andre did an excellent job. Thank you. It was amazing. Uh, it was really clear, so uh, yeah, I, I won't spend too much time on it. Um, this is how we specify the model. I will also not go much, well, very much into detail here, but uh, because, yeah, and they did, really did everything that I was supposed to be doing. Um, I like that. Um, but just, just to give you an idea that, for example, here we are, so we are modeling the number of horizontal first responses as a function of uh, over all, all the trials, and then the, our um, uh, constant effects are uh, uh, SOA, Q, and their interaction. I, yeah, well, and here, this, I, I, I'm just going quickly because you have seen already these things. Just here, what I wanted to um, uh, uh, show was that we also used, so here this variable priors full is a list containing all the uh, uh, posterior distributions of the pilot that are now the priors. Um, then here we're also sampling from the prior distribution, it's going to be useful later on. Um, and then these are some other uh, things that uh, Andre uh, talked about, some other uh, parameters that you can uh, vary uh, with respect to the number of uh, uh, sam sa uh, sampling uh, for each chain, uh, MCMC chain and stuff like that. But I, I'm really not going into this. Um, and of course, if you want to uh, yeah, um, model, if you want to uh, fit other models, you simply have to change uh, yeah, the, 
respective uh, lines, obviously. Um, so we fitted everything, uh, we fitted all, all these models that I, that I uh, talked uh, about uh, earlier, and then we wanted to compare them, and we used the leave one out cross validation. I think it's already been mentioned. Um, so basically the idea is to just uh, take out uh, observations, uh, run the model on the, re on, on the remaining observations, and see the predictive validity of, uh, on, on the uh, unobserved values. And uh, once we do that, uh, we see that the model with the main effect of SOA and Q is the one that has the best predictive validity. Um, so uh, once what, what we can do then is to say, okay, this, this is take a look at the, at the output of this model. Um, this has already been done much more, uh, much, much better than I can ever do. Um, this is only for the uh, constant effects or population level effects. So you have, you know, intercept and, you know, all the other uh, parameters that have been estimated. Um, and as you can see, you can already see, for example, based on what Andre said earlier, that the R hat is 1, which is very good. This means that the, uh, m uh, the conversion, conversion of the MCMC chain is uh, quite good. Um, yeah, this, this is a, these are the fat hairy caterpillars that were mentioned earlier. Um, so this is what you would hope to see uh, if uh, convergence occurred. And now what I did here was to uh, do posterior predictive checks. So the line, the blue line here shows the mean of the observed values. And the histogram is the distribution of the, uh, yeah, the, the, the posterior distribution for the parameters, uh, these uh, uh, example parameters that I put here. So you can see that there is a pretty good correspondence between the observed and the uh, observed values and the, and the posterior uh, distributions. Another way of uh, visualizing uh, yeah, uh, observed and predicted values is by just overlaying, uh, overlaying them on the same graph. So this is the first graph that I showed at the beginning, but then the dotted, li uh, the dotted lines are the observed and the uh, uh, solid lines are the predicted values, and there is a lot of overlap, uh, which I think is we could we could assume that the same data generation process uh, was at play for the observed and the predicted data. That's our hope. Um, now you can also do hypothesis testing, which has already been mentioned earlier. Uh, in this case, for example, we want to uh, make sure we want to check whether the uh, pro the probability of responding horizontal first changed as a function of um, Q condition. So, for example, if there is no Q. Or if there is a vertical, or, or if there is a, the Q was on the vertical line, what's the probability of responding horizontal first? And this is one way of doing it in the RMS. Um, and so what you can see here, for example, is that the probability distribution, the, the posterior distribution, are quite different. Um, so the uh, probability of responding horizontal first is much higher when there is no Q compared to when the vertical lines are Q, which is what we would expect, and would hope for. Um, the final thing that I did here uh, was to check whether the uh, pilot data and the current experiment were really different or were uh, similar with each other. And so basically I, compute, I, I, I uh, did the same hypothesis testing um, showing that the, 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 the prior uh, distribution here in gray, as you can see, and the posterior distribution for these parameters, and see that there's quite a lot of overlap. Um, I'm not sure whether there is a way of doing this in a frequentist framework. I don't know. I'm probably I, I don't know. But this is this makes it so much easier. Um, so just to give you uh, a summary and a, yeah, just to wrap up, what have we learned? Uh, we've learned that the SOA and the Q influence performance independently because the the model with the main effect but no interaction was the one that had the best predictive validity. Um, and we did it through leave one out consolidation criterion. Um, the winning model is the best exactly in terms of predictive accuracy. Um, observed and predicted data were, yeah, uh, as I showed, are very similar. And then we did some hypothesis testing showing that the horizontal first responses are less likely when the vertical lines are queued, which is what we were hoping for. Um, and then uh, that the data of the pilot and the current experiment are really, really similar, which is also something we were hoping. Uh, there is so much more that you can do, so thank you very much for creating this package. Um, 
thank you for your attention and yeah, feel free to contact me if you feel like it. And the slides are available here on my uh, website. Thank you very much.